uh, like a year or two ago, I went to one of the games and one of the players that I was talking shit about, like I, you know, I voice my opinion on the college, like sitting watching him on TV, like, 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 like he's like a big man. Yeah. <laughs> but when I saw him in person, I was like, this man, I would never say this. <laughs> Being in like very high pressure situations, it was always like, it's gonna be great. Like it's gonna be so fun. That was funny because before my first finals of the future, I could barely eat dinner the night before. <laughs> I'm playing for 10, 15 points, like. <laughs> What's up, people? Welcome back to Change Our Podcast. We are in Fort Lauderdale here. My name is Justin Roberts. To my left, Jordan McGinley and Evan Zhu. We're here during the Miami Open, so hopefully a few special episodes. Um, don't forget, we have to deal with Pro Stringer. If you use our code, change over the checkout at, on their website, get $100 off. Great machine, use it at home on the road. Easy to travel with, save you a lot of money. And uh, yes, we also have merch. If you check the link tree in our Instagram, you can buy hoodies, t-shirts, pullovers, and you will be supporting the podcast, helping us pay for editing costs, because it's not free to do this. Uh, <laughs> and we're losing money. We just started the YouTube monetization. We made about $12 in about eight days, so we might need a little bit of help. Uh, today we have a very special guest. This, is, um, this young lady has a birthday coming up soon mm, one wednesday wednesday i think she's turning 27 or 28 uh she makes the, the game of tennis look very easy i never actually seen her sweat you got jordy over here sweating evan sweat and she <laughs> unnecessary she put on a, a beanie because it's so cool <laughs> in there bro uh she is a curry roadie and oxtail lover that's why i have some oxtail yesterday it didn't last very long she's a seven-time champion on wta tour 2018 miami, miami, miami open champion yep yes 2017 U.S. Open champion, and probably maybe her biggest achievement might be starting the Open Foundation in 2013. This is our very first Grand Slam champion on the podcast, Sloan Stevens. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm so honored. The first Grand Slam champion. The first one. <laughs> <laughs> more to come, yes. Hopefully, hopefully we do a good come. job. <laughs> so we start a little tradition now where we play a game before we get started into the, to the serious stuff. So we're going to do five questions. Okay. They've been trying to see who has the most, let's say, tennis and random trivia knowledge. Okay. Hold on, we're more cutthroat this episode, right? If someone's out the game, they're out the game. Ooh, no more last, extra last? life. Unless it's more fun to do a, a last, last question. Last question is more points, though, right? If you're still in the game. So if we have a tie, there'll be a bonus question. Okay. And it won't be tennis related. Okay. And it won't. So now, the first five questions, you have to answer right on the board first. Mm-hmm. And then we each read our answers out and we keep score. Okay. But the last question is first to answer game that. Last, okay. last time it was a math question. Yeah. Guess who got it? You. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, question. don't show me your thing. All right. You're right. Question number one. Who did Alex Demino beat in the final of Acapulco? Y'all don't watch no tennis. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, this year? Mm. Brother. Goodness gracious. Why do I remember the story more than the actual tennis match that he left the, the next morning to go yeah, he went to, to San see. Diego? Yeah. Remember the wrong dance. Tell me. Ten seconds for this one. Nico, okay. help. <laughs> Think she watched tennis? No. Bro. All right. You done? You locked in? No, no. Yeah, I don't know who won that. I don't even know who he is. Five. Four. I can't even name another player in the three, tournament. Two. This is so wrong. One. All right. Two. Ladies first, Simone. Cam Nori? No. Evan? Holger? No. Casper Ruud? Jody McGinley. That's one. Oh. That's one. That's one. That's okay, one. That's, that's one. That's one. Yeah. Run the board. Run the board. Run the board. Food. Okay. Run the board. I watch tennis. So now we get geography. You all travel. We got tennis players in there. Oh. What is the capital of Australia? <laughs> Let's tell me which letter is saying sweet. Mr. the UCLA over here. I'm just going to do this. I know it's wrong. Uh, whatever. Want a clue? No, 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 no clues. No clues. All right. okay. You locked in? Yeah, I'm ready. Slow I have game. two answers, but I don't know what it is. Is it Perth? No. 
fudge, and I know what it is. We'll go again. <laughs> <laughs> we can't throw it up. We don't touch it. <laughs> okay, okay, go, go, go. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You, you, the next two questions are just for you, tailored for you to win. <laughs> you, Sydney. No. <laughs> okay, well then let me go because I know the answer. Was it? Canberra? Yes. Okay. What? I wouldn't, that'll give you 0.5? I had them both. Yeah. I had them both. That wouldn't have been I my guess. Like, I don't know which one. That would not have been my guess. So what is it? 1 1? No, no. 1 1 0 0. Okay. Yeah, I won't take that. 1.5? Well, I mean, you only have 0.5. Yeah, I'll give you a 0.5. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, throw me the other 0.5. <laughs> <laughs> what clothing brand is slow and sponsored by? Uh, oh no! See, you have these guests on. You talk about how much you want to talk to them, <laughs> you do, and you do no research. That's the problem. That's the problem, right? That there. is the problem. That you come in here, problem. not ready. The craziest part is questions. we have two pages of two. notes here, and that's not in any of the notes. No, I got them in my notes. No worry. Oh my word! I'll I'll just pass on this. <laughs> <laughs> just give Sloan. Okay. Sloan, now you have one point five. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Jody. What you got? Oh, I have nothing, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sloan, you wear what? What do you endorse? Free people movement. Oh, Free FP people movement. movement. FP movement. Oh, dude. Shout out to so we got them. Sloan up. 1.5, 1, Evan 0. You have never gotten any question right on this podcast besides the bonus one. No, which, the math which was me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not sitting right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who did Sloan beat in the semifinals of US Open 2017? It would be open nine a question. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you even know who I am? Or like, what's going on? I want to put a wrong guess, but it's gonna be commendable. Let him go first. Are you serious? Like, Let him go first. Delete it. <laughs> <laughs> try again. Try again. Try again. Like, do another guess. That would be better. Uh, oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. Like, you don't do that and still get it wrong. Like, no. I mean, that was just a terrible guess. Like. Why would you ask this question specifically? No, because I want to no, make sure she she would be in the run up. I didn't know if she would watch men's tennis or not. Or right. no, no. What are we doing here? Help. Evan, I thought I had a cutthroat. Yes. First try. <laughs> Evan, also Venus Williams, Jordy, Serena. No. <laughs> well, first of all, he started with Madison Keys. <laughs> that was like the final. That's the, that's the final. Yeah, and then, no, so then that's the final. So we should all. I'm gonna get Evan a point five. No, 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 because I would have No, 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 he went from Madison to Serena to then Venus. Oh, no, so no, no, you get zero. Really cool. So Sloan got 2.5. <laughs> Sloan hasn't answered yet. Uh, Venus, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you were at the match. Yeah, All right. Okay, this one's going to be worth two points. Give Jordy a chance. This is question number five. Okay. Spell Lubicic. Ivan Lubicic last name Lubicic L This don't look right Just look at it from here <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you looking at it or no? I shouldn't I feel like we're gonna I feel like they have like a little letter like this one in here somewhere You know what I mean? <laughs> Where you gonna put it though? <laughs> Let's slide it right in here or is it here? You know what I mean? It's one of these two. Right here. I'm going to give you guys 10 seconds to lock this one in. You know what? I'm just going to save myself and not even answer. Not answer. What do you mean not answer? Because I'm going to be made fun of on the internet. <laughs> for being a coward? Okay, that's good. Go on, man. Wow. Do something for more. I go first? <laughs> Hell, you. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody look down, 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 down. That's crazy what you just did. But you can't change it. <laughs> Who can't change it? <laughs> Who can't change it? <laughs> Leave that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember how you spent it. Slower. No, talk no, to no. you. Let him go first. Okay, Alright. L U B J C I C. No. Go ahead. Jody, talk to L U B. Yeah, just stick with your hands. I J C I C. No. Slow with your girlfriend. This well, game is L U B I C J I C. 
Okay, so the correct answer <laughs> is L J U B I C I C. The sneaky J after the L. We can not catch you every time. But Sloan wins with a with a landslide victory. Landslide. Two point five to one. Yeah, and right Evan still has zero. I started. <laughs> I started hard. I liked that a lot. Mix it up a little bit. Okay. So we put the boards away and we can get started with the... On tussle over there. Hey. I am two star. There you go, one. Yeah, thanks. Let's get into it, guys. Boy. Okay. All right, so Sloan, can we talk a little bit about your introduction to tennis? So, obviously, you had a good junior career, um, you know, getting pretty high in juniors, and then, you know, you had your success on the pro career. But what was it like growing up for you in the game of tennis in South Florida? What, what was your junior years looking like? Yeah, so I started playing tennis pretty, like, fairly late for, like, a pro player. I started when I was nine, so it was, like, kind of when most kids were playing, like, little Mo's at probably, like, five and six. Like, I hadn't even started playing tennis yet. So um, it was interesting because when we moved to Florida and I started playing more, I went to Everett, which was across the street from Boca Prep. Um, and I started playing more full time and like getting better and improving. And it was interesting because like I wasn't, I was very like innocent in the game. Like, I didn't know like cheating. Like, you know, I've been to play designated <laughs> and like your kids are cheating, the parents are wild. Like, it was definitely a new experience for me, but I had started late. So I wasn't really like, I didn't know what was going on, which I think was probably good. Um, but yeah, like growing up playing in Florida was obviously interesting, but fun at the same time. And then like getting better. I wasn't good until I was like 16. So. Okay, I mean, and then did it change? Like, did your approach change when you started to improve? Um, no. I mean, you know me, my personality. I've like been the same person since I was like five. So okay. I think like, um, I just was enjoying myself. It was fun. Like tennis was fun for me. It still is fun, but um, it was very much just like I was out there enjoying myself. I was athletic. I was had talent. I was good. Um, but it didn't really like click until i was like 16 i would right. say did you um, play did you play any other sports growing up no none at, was at this time you were at you were training at Everett exclusively um, this, at that time is when Everett and usca were at the same place right they weren't there yet i'm like showing my age now because the usa wasn't there yet okay. but i was at Everett for like a year and a bit and then i went to south county park with sylvester black okay and then we had like a really group like good group of like kids that we played after school and so i went to Boca prep and then after school we would go to slice and play at south county park okay did you have any um like thoughts to go to college or it was always you were, i mean i think you were playing slams at what 16 17 yeah i would say i don't know when i played my first like qualies of a slam okay. but i'd probably say like 17 18 okay that sounds about right um but i was gonna go to ucla and then I got a good offer from like an agency to turn pro and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles were all like, you should just go for it. Like you never know what could happen. And I think I kind of just, again, I wasn't good when I was young. I didn't have the pressure of like, oh my God, my dream was to go pro. Like I wasn't like, oh my God, this it's do or die. Like I never had that type of pressure. So yeah. when the opportunity came, I was like, okay, like I'll try it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll try it. Like, let's see what happens. Um, but I definitely was going to go to college. That was like what I thought I was going to be doing. I never was like, oh my God, I'm for sure going pro. I'm going to be number one in the world. Like, that wasn't my thought process. It was just like, I'm having fun. I'm playing well. I'm going to be able to go to college for free. Like, yay. And that was <laughs> not that, think that mindset helps you when you're playing matches, like to play without pressure? Or do you have other like pressures from other places? Um, yeah, like when I was growing up and like just coming on the tour, um, I would say I didn't have really any, like I was just out there playing and having a good time as I like kind of, I felt like I've had like three careers since I got injured. I won a slam then I came back and I like, there's been a lot of like different moments for me, but I would say that the pressure at every angle has been very different in terms of like at the beginning, the pressure was just like, ooh, am I, like, going to be in the top 50? Like, am I going to be able to, like, get into the top 20? And then it was like, okay, am I ever going to win a Grand Slam? Or 
am I ever going to get to top 10 or whatever it was? And I think once you kind of like check those boxes off, like the pressure becomes like, okay, how much more money can I make? Or how, like, how good can I get my ranking or whatever it is? Like how many tournaments can I win? Or I haven't won this tournament. I want to win this tournament. Like I said, I think the the pressure just kind of evolves like in your own mind, like as a player and like things that you've done in your career and that you want to do more of. Exactly. Um, But when I like first started, like the goal wasn't like, oh, I I definitely want to be number one in the world. Like, did it ever become that at any point? No, I mean, it would have been nice. Like, it would have been great to be number one in the world. But winning a Grand Slam at home and coming off of an injury and not playing for seven, eight months, however long I was out, being 900 in the world, winning a Slam, like, I don't think I could have, like, written it any better. Yeah. So I think, like, if that was my, like, really great opportunity in tennis, like, I wouldn't change it for, like to be number one in the world for a week no yeah. and that hasn't changed since since that week no I, like i said at the beginning of like my career and I, I that wasn't like my goal like i was literally just playing because it was fun yeah. and like i enjoyed it and i was good at it you mentioned the game being fun but there's like this narrative about you that you don't enjoy playing like you look like you don't care it's yeah everyone thinks i hate it yeah. <laughs> But like, does everybody go to work every day and is like, I fucking love it here? Like, <laughs> like no, absolutely not. I think so, it's like unrealistic to be like, I wake up every day and go to practice and I'm like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when you're playing a match and you're enjoying it, what is the difference? Like, what can we see in your face or in your, I guess, demeanor that's different than when you're having a, a rougher time out there? I don't know, because I feel like there's been some times where I've been like, oh, my God, that match was so fun. Like, it was so competitive. Like, I really loved it. And they're like, you look like a dead horse out there. Like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I actually thought I had a good time. But, I mean, so I don't know. I think everyone's, like, narrative. Again, again, these are people who are, like, betting on matches who, like, have, are, like, you know, have something in the race. It's like like, a story. Yeah, it's always, like, the storyline. But I'm like, if you look at, like, what they say about, I don't know, I don't even know, like, a random play. Like, Madison Keys, like, her narrative is, like, totally different. And they're like, why doesn't she hit more aces? Why doesn't she do, like, it's like there's always going to be some sort of whatever. But, like, every time that I actually feel like I'm like, oh, my God, I was, like, really high energy today. And I thought I did really well. They're like, why do you look, like, casket ready? And I'm like. (laughs) How do you deal with it? Does it bother you at all? Uh, No. I mean, I've had so many crazy, mean, psychotic things said to me. I'm Mm -hmm. just like. Whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, the press room can't be as bad as the Instagram DMs. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been through, like, FBI cases and, like, all types of stuff, like, from people. You You said what? (laughs) (laughs) I Yeah, I've just had, like, (laughs) (laughs) terrible experiences, like, online. And, yeah, people have gone to jail for, like, yeah, harassing me on the Internet. Mm -hmm. It's, like, a real thing. I mean... I don't know. I've never gotten the police involved in my cases, you know. <laughs> but I think they give up on me, so it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they don't bet on me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's just a very, especially when you're winning and there's like a lot happening and people are betting more and like people are very into it. It's just that's what people. That's like people's go-to. Like we go to work every day. People go and bet every day. Like mm-hmm. that's their thing, right? They make a living off of that. And I think had a time where like the like we were just getting into like social media like 10 years ago i would say it was like not that big of a deal but then as we've gotten like smarter and there's more apps and there's more access and you can like literally dm anybody like i think now it's become obviously way more of a problem but i mean i'm i'm not going to jail for anybody so i will not get on the internet and talk shit to anyone i'm like are there uncomfortable moments in person do you ever run it run into any of these people like in person or is it I mean, I'm assuming that the security at at these uh, at the big tournaments are good. So yeah, no, I mean, anything that people say to you online, they would never say to you in person. Yeah, like, and I would definitely think I'd be ready to fight. Like, if oh, somebody like somebody came up to me and like some of the things that they've said to me, like if someone came up to me and was like, I can't even say it on here. Like, if they were like, you like, please say it. Keep that use right there. Like, I don't know, like some of the things people write you, you're like. What if they were like you black monkey bitch? I'd be like, what's up? I, 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 like, I, 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 when and where? Yeah, you know? like we gotta go. Like we're not just gonna walk away. Like it's just not possible. But I think 
that's not even a bad one. Like there's so many other whatever, but I, I think that it's just become so normal for these yeah. people to do that, that it's like made it okay. It's funny. Cause I would never do that. Like, I mean, I, I watch Manchester United, the football team, and obviously I'm passionate about it. You know, so sometimes yeah. if a player's not doing good, I'm on the couch going crazy. But I would never go and say would something. Never to, I would never go to the Instagram. <laughs> yeah. But I was telling Justin, uh, like a year or two ago, I went to one of the games. And one of the players that I was talking shit about, like I, you know, I would voice my opinion on the couch, like sitting watching him on TV, like, like I can't like, believe like, he's like a, a big man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when I saw him in person, I was like, this man, I would never say this. <laughs> <laughs> he was Absolutely literally like, no chance. No way. Mm-mm. Like, no way. But I think that's the problem is that like these people have no actual access to you. So they say whatever, right? And then they see you in person and they're like actual fans. Yeah. Like they're, they actually want like a picture with you mm. or they want like, and you're like, you literally were just cussing me out online. Like, how is it possible? confused. Like, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, to go back to the U.S. Open just a little bit about the one that you won. So was there any different feeling going into that U.S. Open about where your game was at compared to Thomas in the past? Because you won a few WTAs before that. Um, but did you, did you feel any more or less confident that week? Did you approach it any differently? Like, what, what changed that week um, at the biggest event? Um, yeah so I was injured I had surgery in January of 2017 and then I was on I was like on crutches I was in a wheelchair like I couldn't walk the whole thing um I was non I was non-weight bearing for 16 weeks so I couldn't put any pressure on my foot for 16 weeks was a long time and then I started playing again in like May like I could actually like stand up on the court and hit and then my first tournament back was Wimbledon. So I played Wimbledon. I lost first round to Ali Risk. Um, I played a good match, but like it was tough. Like I hadn't played in a really long time. I hadn't played since the Olympics of the prior year. So since 2016. Wow. Were you on a protected? I was on a protected, yeah. Right. So when I came back, my protected, I think, was like 30 something, maybe like 38 or something right. like that. So I could get into all the tournaments with my protected and then. I played Wimbledon, then I came back and I played in D.C. I played Halep first round in D.C. And I played a good match, but obviously really tough. Like, she was probably, like, top five in the world at the time. Not Maybe not number one yet, but she was still up there. And then I went to Toronto. Or I made finals of doubles in D.C. with Jeannie Bouchard. When we played, it was, like, a good week. We played well. Um, and then I went to Toronto. I made semis in Toronto. I lost to Wozniacki in the semis, but it was fine. I was tired as hell. Um, and then went to Cincinnati, lost in the semis to Halep there. And I played well. Like I play, I was like cruising. I was doing well, beating all the people I should beat, you know, whatever. And everyone, I think, kind of was like, where'd she come from? Because I hadn't played all year, basically. Um, and then going into the U.S. Open, we were like pulling out. Probably like the second day of practice we had gotten there. And... Mary Carrillo and Paul Anacone were working for Tennis Channel and they were like coming out of the whatever, like the little like thing, like the what do they call it? Like the broadcasters, like, yeah. like, like thing they had over there. Yeah. And they came to the car and we we're talking and everybody loves to talk to my mom. So, of course, they were like chatting it up. And then Paul and Mary, were like, you know, you could win tournaments alone. And I was like, okay. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I said, if I play well, I'll have a good result. I'll, I'll, try to do something good right and um i was like yeah whatever so we kind of like went about our day and whatever in our our next two weeks and and then i was in the semis and i remember me and my mom and my friend tanya were sitting in the room in my hotel room we had just come back from dinner and there was like a little you know espn does like little tickers or whatever and it says like it was like just saying it's like sloan stevens defeated venus williams and it said like the prize money next to it and i was like holy shit i'm rich (laughs) i was like mom i am rich girl and she was like oh my god like i was like oh my god that's how much money you make oh my goodness and i was like wow um but it didn't say how much you made for the final so like i had then i was in the final so i had like beaten venus and i was in the final and i was like oh my god but it didn't say how much money like the rest was it just said how much you like got to that Mm -hmm. point and I was like, I better win the tournament then. I was like, mom, we got to win the tournament. <laughs> and so from then I was like, oh, like I couldn't, not that I couldn't believe that I'd gotten that far. I had played so many hard matches. I'd say like first round I played like Vinci who had made the finals the year before. 
Then I played Sybil Kova, who won the tournament the week before in New Haven. I played Gerges, who was like top 20 at the time. I played Ash Barty, who was like just coming back, but she was obviously playing well. Um, and who else did I play? Well, I'm I sure the matches before led up to it was good. Like you said, you lost to Halep yeah. twice that summer, and she was on her way to the top. Like yeah, you said, like you beat five. the people that you thought that you should have beaten. Yeah, so. like I didn't lose to anyone that I was like, oh, that was a bad loss. Like, I don't even, that whole entire summer, like I yeah. didn't. I was like, okay, this is So even leading up, you probably felt like you were in a good place. Like. Yeah, I was in a really good place, and I just didn't... I mean, I had nothing to lose. I hadn't played all year, had made no money all year. I was, like, on disability. I was, like, just, like, chilling. So I was <laughs> like, might as well make some money. Um, but, yeah, there was no... Absolutely no pressure for me to perform at that point. Um, and there was no expectations. Everyone was just happy that I was back and I was playing and I was healthy. Um, obviously, having surgery in the first week of January, like, at the beginning of a new season not ideal yeah. so just being able to play everyone was happy with and obviously having good results totally unexpected because i had played and then um being able to beat like good players who were actually at the time like playing well like at the top of the game i was like okay this is not you bad. feel like at that time it was very competitive like the top players yeah for sure like i in toronto i played safarova who was i think at the time she was also top 20 and she had two match points, and I came back and won. Like, I think, like, those, like, little things, like, were what, like, kind of gave me confidence for, yeah. like, the next matches or whatever. Like, I was beating people in the top 20, and I was, like, playing really well. I was co- overcoming, like, a bit of adversity, like, here and there. And, like, you're just kind of, like, stepping stones to, like, playing better and better and better and kind of just getting that, like, rhythm and that confidence back. And then, obviously, once I got to the US Open, I was like, okay, like, I was playing tough matches, but... I was still in the matches. I was, like, beating these people. So I was like, okay, I might as well be able to, you know, take it a little further. Um, okay, you beat Venus. Mm-hmm. And now you in the final. And are you favored to win, do you feel? Or is it? Um, I don't think or it's so. Even, or she just like came the- back from injury. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well, she's beating everybody. She said that she's killing yeah, you. Like- Every day healthy is a blessing, bro. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't think I was favored to win. I think it was more like Maddie was also injured mm-hmm. during the year. So we were both injured at the same time, like at home texting each other, like, what are you doing? What's happening? Like, whatever. You like- you so-, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like we didn't have like we both. Yeah, we were both were injured, so there was nothing like there was no expectation. So you both, it's just all upside. Uh, yeah, that much. It was on the up and up. Um, okay, so the the money is there in your mind when you're playing the match, or what is? Oh no, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just like, it's just like funny that to see it on the TV. And yeah, then, I was like, oh my god, and then like I was like in my room, like watching replays of myself, like mm-hmm. on Sports Center. So how do you keep such a big situation low pressure? It's, it sounds like to to me, it's like. Oh yeah, we played the finals of US Open <laughs> tomorrow, and it's like I mean, it's okay, it whichever way like, it goes. No, it's totally like that. I think yeah. like if you have a mom like mine, like yeah. Jesus Christ, like I think you, the moments that are like supposed to be very serious are totally not serious. Yeah. Like she was just like, oh, it's gonna be so fun. Like my friends are coming. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. Like yeah. my friends, my brother, my sister, my aunt, and like you know, like the whole thing was yeah. very like fluid and exciting and fun, and I think growing up how i grew up with my mom just being like oh like it's a good time like tennis is fun yay like rah rah like everything was always like a good experience and i think being in like very high pressure situations it was always like it's gonna be great like it's gonna be so fun my mom's like like you know what i mean like if you know my mom she everything that she does and says she's like it's gonna be amazing like i love it like i mean (laughs) like she's just like this is so fun like that was funny because before my first finals of the future, I could barely eat dinner the night before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing for 10, 15 points. Like, <laughs> this is a big deal for me, you know what I mean? To go in, I call my dad. It can cool. Try to eat an extra spoonful of rice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, funny. it is yeah. like that, though. Like, you get super nervous. I get very nervous. I can't eat either. And, like, mm-hmm. I'm just like, I totally feel you on that. Mm-hmm. But I definitely think. It's like the way how whatever sport you play, like how it's like presented to you is yeah. how you probably always will like remember it yeah. or like like the feeling that you get from it. And I think from growing up until like even now, like it was always like, OK, if we win, we're going to sushi. Like, you know, like it was always like an exciting, like fun, rewarding yeah. thing for me. And I think 
I obviously would raise my kids like that because like it makes your kid or whoever like excited about whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and I think as I got older and like had better results and whatever, like, I mean, the US Open was great. I won the US Open, right? I was in the French Open final and I didn't win. And it was like absolutely devastating. French Open was like the only tournament that like I've ever wanted to win. Like, mm-hmm. like I have to win the French Open. I like, just have to. I don't know. Like I've always done so well there. I've made, it's been my best slam. I've made fourth round uh, or the second week of the French Open for the last 12 years or something, 10 years, something like that. So like, it's been my best slam with most matches. And like, I just always wanted to win there. And when I didn't, it was like heartbreaking. I swear I cried for like a week. It was like devastating. But after I was like, okay, it just wasn't my time. Like it wasn't meant for me to win the French Open. It wasn't meant for me to like, have that moment and like I think that's like I'm I'm able to accept that like that just was like that was Simona's time it was her time to like win a grand slam like whatever it may be like it just was that wasn't meant for me like maybe yeah. God will reward me with something else and more greater and more whatever but like that just like everyone has their moment that was her moment and I was like okay that's it like, it's funny on. because like talking about the a majority of professional tennis players, especially I'm assuming at the top of the game, they are pretty clear internal goals. Like they want to be this in the world. They want to win this tournament, blah, blah, blah. But for you, like winning the US Open, I'm sure as a, an American, it must have been special, but it's not. It wasn't like life or death that you win the US Open or you don't in your career. So like do you wake up after winning the US Open. Is there a letdown now that you've achieved somewhat of a goal? Because... I, know, I, I could assume that for other people, if it's a huge goal of theirs, they win it. And maybe it could be like, what now? You know? Yeah. So how was it for you? Did you have any, anything was different besides your bank account? Um, yeah. <laughs> wake up the next day. Um, yeah, it was different. I was like totally lost and confused. I was like, what happens now? Like, what do we like? Where do we go from here? I also was very injured after the US Open too. And I like tried to play for another six months and it was like a disaster. But I think after I was like, okay, well, like, I won that. And then obviously I continued to have good results. Like I made, I won Miami Open right after, not right after. I actually lost like 10 matches in a row, but. We can skip over that. <laughs> I was injured. I just remember being injured and I like couldn't do anything. I couldn't walk. I couldn't like, it was terrible. And I was still playing because I didn't want to get any fines. So I was like, let me just continue to play. And then I think I lost like eight matches in a row or 10. It was eight or 10 matches in a row. And then I won Miami Open, which was the last year that it was at Key Biscayne, which was really cool. And then I made the French Open final, had a complete mental breakdown over the summer, like on the clay when I was like supposed to be playing well. And like it was a disaster. Um, Then made the French Open final, did okay at US Open, like courted again after like defending the points, obviously from winning the previous year. Then I made the year in final that year. So like I, I still had purpose and like, it, like I still was playing well, but I just was like tired. And I was like, what am I playing for? Like, why am I out here? Like I did what I was supposed to do type of thing. Like yeah. I won the grand slam, like yay, rah, rah. And I was like, what happens now? Right. Like, what do I, like, what am I playing for? Like, what is the purpose? And yeah, like so in, that was hard. At that, in that moment, did do you kind of try to remember why you started playing in the beginning? Like how, like what you said, like how you and your mom approach matches. Like, is that kind of why you've been playing? Like, obviously now you're trying. I'm assuming to get back to to as high as you can get. So, yeah. like, is that what you think about now when you're playing, or what's on your mind or going did you into find some like of these a, a different purpose or something? Um, yeah, I think my purpose now is. Like, just my vision of tennis is, like, a little bit different. Like, yes, I would love to be back in the top 20. And, like, I was telling my coach the other day, I was like, you know, my ranking hasn't moved in, like, a year. I'm like, who are are these people playing these matches? Like, where are they getting these points from? Like, what's happening? I'm like, do I not play enough? Like, do I need to travel some more? Like, what do I need to do? Like, I think that... What did you say back? (laughs) He was like, shit. I don't know. You're having a good time on here, too. (laughs) Sushi. Um, yeah, right? He's like, this is fun. I mean, um, no, I think it's just like, it's very different when you are like figuring it out. Like, and I'm like, is the only thing that I really want to do, like make my ranking better? Like, then what's that going to do for like, is that going to like yeah. change anything? Is that going to like make me happier? Like, I think a lot of tennis players, like tennis, like completely defines your life and like who you are. Like when you're winning, like you feel good about yourself when you're losing, you're like, 
I'm a piece of shit type of thing. Like, it's like you feel so bad about yourself, like based on like literally what your ranking is. And I was like, I feel like okay right now, but yeah. I'm like, am I like, like your worth feels like determined of like yeah. how good of a tennis player you I'm are. I'm guilty of that too. Yeah, but I think it's like a tennis player thing. It's like if your ranking's good, you're like, oh, I feel good. And if your ranking's bad and you're not having good results, you're like, I need to be in a psychic war. Like, it's like you're like <laughs> literally like about to walk off the ledge. You're like, what's going on? But it's so that doesn't happen to you. You don't you don't see it that way. Or you at least you try not to let it be that way. Yeah, I try not to. Like I my ring like I said, my ring has been the same for like a year and I'm like I'm not walking off the we're ledge. Good. Like <laughs> we're, we're good. Like I'm waking up every day, like I got food to eat, like doing a podcast with my friends. Like yeah. I just don't have like I love tennis, like don't get me wrong. And like I go to practice and I like practice hard and I do everything I can and I like take care of my body and I do all these things and like I try to be as professional as I can and like do everything that's going to make me better. And I think sometimes like it doesn't click, but again, I'm not like I'm doing the best that I can. So at the end of the day, I'm like, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's not, it's not like meant to be, I guess, but I'm not, again, I'm not like walking off the ledge. Cause I'm like, you know, this is the end of this is the end of it. Like I'm like, you know what I mean? Like it's not like, I, I feel like it's either going to click at some point or it's not, or like, Maybe I'll, like, win the French Open. I don't know. Yeah. Like, that's how tennis is. It's very up and down. And, like, you literally have no idea what's going to happen week to week. Like, next week I go in Miami Open, everyone would be like, oh, my God, we love you again. Slow's back. <laughs> yeah, slow's back. <laughs> Where has she been? <laughs> but it's like, that's how tennis is. Like, your value is literally based on your week to week performance and your ranking. And Go ahead. Sorry. Like, what sort of things do you place most the most value in? I know you got the foundation. Mm-hmm. And so obviously you're passionate about helping helping kids and and doing that. But along with that, like, what is that about the foundation? And along with that, what other things make you like? What makes Sloan Sloan? Like besides hitting tennis balls? Oh, that's such a good question, Justin. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, okay, no. So I started the foundation in 2013, and it's so this is going to be our 11th year now, and. It, we mostly serve underserved kids in Compton Unified, which is like 89 or 90 percent like Hispanic. So a lot of our kids have never seen a tennis racket, have never seen a tennis ball, never seen a tennis court, have never seen anyone play tennis. Mm-hmm. Right. So instead of having soccer and basketball and like basically like to play soccer is like a very low, like low lift sport. You just need a ball and like. Literally, like, your friends could be the goalposts and, like, like you know, like a t-shirt or, like, whatever, right? It's, like, Open your very, desk. yeah, literally, like, it's so so easy and simple. And tennis just requires a lot. So, again, tennis has given me so much in my life. And I'm always, like, okay, we need to give back. We need to do more. We need to be able to have kids experience tennis. And, like, even if it's, like, just in a very small way just being able to like put rackets in their hands let them experience it let them just hit a ball let them see if they like it you know and and i think my tennis experience has been very fun my very first coach francisco gonzalez was amazing i loved him he looked across like he worked across the street and i walked across the street every day to my little lesson i rode my bike across the street to my lesson and like i would get there and every single day he was so happy to see me he was so excited and like i want that for kids who probably would never even think about playing tennis because it's a good opportunity. And I always say that tennis has so many jobs, so many opportunities, so many ways to travel the world, so many people to meet, so many resources. I just don't feel like people take enough advantage of what tennis has to offer. So being able to offer that to our kids in Compton, um, through the foundation, we've had about like 10 first generation high school graduates. Um, We have about 10 kids who are now currently in college um, who graduated high school, went to college, went to four-year colleges, went to two-year colleges. Um, and that, I think, for us at the Foundation is success just because it's like we work with the whole school district, so we service about 6,000 kids a year, which for us is amazing. And I think being able to change people's lives through tennis is important. Obviously, my life was changed through tennis, my mom's life, my, my entire family, right? So being able to give that back and have someone else experience you know, graduating from high school or going to college or being able to play on their high school tennis team. Like, I think those are wins for us through the foundation. And I think, um, obviously, when I stop playing tennis, I will continue to do that. But I I do love helping people and helping my community. And that's just been a big part of my life um, through while I've been playing. And then obviously now, like post US Open, just kind of finding new purpose and finding new reason to like get out there and like, 
help as many people as I can and just encourage people to play the sport of tennis because it is. You, I'm you, curious because obviously being a minority in the sport of tennis, mm -hmm. we black. Um, it seems like when black people do well in the sport, at least from the way I see it, like in the media and stuff, it seems like you get this, you know, like he's saying, responsibility mm -hmm. to, I guess, usher in a generation of, let's say, people of color and I guess either grow the sport or give people opportunities to play. Do you feel like that's, like he said, your responsibility? And do you embrace that? Like, is that a source of pressure or is it just something that kind of you take pride in? No, I think it's great. Honestly, like, representation matters. I think when I started playing, like, Venus and Serena were still playing. Uh, Shonda Rivon wasn't playing still. Like, Xena, Lori, they weren't. But, like, Lori McNeil is, like, a big part of my tennis life. And, like, seeing her, you know, teach me how to volley. Like, she literally taught me how to hit volleys and, like, approach shots, right? And I think being able to see her, like, in action and, like, help me was helpful, right? Seeing Venus and Serena in real life and then playing against them was very helpful. But there's only, like, even now, there's, like, maybe eight black tennis players that play like mm -hmm. and thank god like we're pretty decent like mm -hmm. that you see us on tv a lot and people can see see us and kids can yeah, look right. up to us but it hasn't always been like that right yeah. there hasn't been this massive group of like representation in tennis and i think obviously tennis is considered a rich sport a wealthier sport mm -hmm. so it's harder to break those barriers of kids like who may be super athletic or super talented being able to play because it's just not feasible for a lot of families right so it does matter i feel like that the people see us on tv and see us to being like yes this this sport is attainable like we can't have our kids play that i think that part is like really important because it does actually like flip the switch for people who parents who may be watching t tennis on tv and are like i really want my kid to to play tennis yeah right? you know not to go off topic here but i feel like what you just said about people view tennis about as being um a rich sport or like an expensive sport, you know, but then if you actually look at the the income of people in tennis, like the higher higher ranked players and compare that to other sports, like I don't know if if the outcome is as similar as you would think. You know, like it's expensive to get into the sport and then mm -hmm. what you get back at the top of the game is not the same as you would get back from like what you said about, you know, football or or baseball, basketball. I don't know I'm not sure about how the golf money is, but it's interesting that it's hard to it's expensive to get into the sport, and even yeah. when you get to the top of the game, you're not rewarded financially as much. much money. Yeah, you know what I mean. Something like a win-win. Maybe, maybe they should play that. Play tennis for fun. No, 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 no. I will say I have been, I have been fairly compensated. Don't make that clear. Yeah, yeah, Not complaining. I've made a lot of money. I'm very happy with my job. Hashtag WTA, but you like, yeah. <laughs> I do think obviously with other sports, like, yes, I would love to make an NBA player salary. They make, I mean, league minimum or like vet minimum. Like mm. if we made as much as they made, like, I think the vet minimum now is like, I want to say it's like $3 million or something. I'm like, and that's like guaranteed. And you, if you're a vet, like some of them, like no offense, do sit on the bench and like you are just traveling with your team. Like, yeah. I would love to do that. And they're, like, actually not playing. Like, we're, like, playing every single week. And that's the aspect that you're like, responsible for your own, like, yeah. coaching, travel, all this kind of stuff. You're so. responsible for all of your own expenses. You're responsible for your team. You're responsible for, yeah, like, basically other other people, right? If something happens to my coach when we're in a foreign country, like, helping them go to the doctor. Like, every, like you're all one, right? It's, like, it's a, it's a team thing. It's a team game. And, and I feel like even baseball players, basketball players, like they all make these significant salaries based on, you know, them having unions and them having all of these player bargaining agreements and all this stuff. And like in tennis, we don't have that. So we're always cut like a little bit short. Um, again, we make a lot of money. If you look at like the top players in the game, like Novak's made over a hundred million dollars in prize money. Like there's Damn. been people, <laughs> <laughs> there's the people who have been so successful and done so well, like Roger, Rafa, Novak, Andy, like they've all had incredible careers and made so much money, but the gap between them and like the next little group is pretty far, I'd say. And then I'd say also that. The people, even on the girl side, like some of our top earners, like Serena, I think Serena's made a hundred million in prize money or close to it or something like that. And I think like the next gap, it goes from like Serena and Venus and then it's like the next is like 35 million or something. So it goes from like a hundred million 
50 million, 35 million, something like that, which again, we're talking about millions of dollars here. This yeah. is not jump change, but um, for people, that's over a period of a 10 year, 12 year, 15 year career. Venus and Serena played 20 something plus years. Um, and again, NBA players, like, you know, they pay 10 years and they've made 350 million. Yeah. Like, is this something that y'all talk about at, at all? Because, I mean, obviously, you know, we've played mostly futures and challenges yeah. um, to this point. So, obviously, it's something that we talk about a lot, you know, trying to figure out how to schedule tournaments, what tournaments to play, mm -hmm. different levels, price, money. If you go to the challenges, maybe you get housing versus maybe you go to a future, maybe it's a better opportunity to get more points. Like, but is that something that you guys ever talk about? Like, the like scheduling according to budget and, you know, like, I guess your team and that sort of stuff? Um, I wouldn't say that particular is like a topic of conversation. I think that at WTA tournaments, you do get your room paid for. So wherever you go, your room is free. Um, you normally get to eat on site. You get two meals a day. Um, if you and you get minimum nights, so you get if you go to a 250, sure. you get five nights minimum. If you go to a 1000, it's 10 nights minimum. I only know all this because I'm the player council, so I have all these like small details that obviously matter a lot to players that are like just starting out, just traveling. Like it matters. Like if you can't go home and you need somewhere to stay, you're not paying, you know, two hundred dollars a night for a hotel room because all of that adds up, right? Especially when it's your own expense. Um, so the tours have done a really good job in order to help the players, especially players like when we go to Europe. Like there's nowhere for us to go, right? So we have to stay at the tournament. We have to practice. We have to be there. Like, you can't go anywhere. So having 10 nights of a free hotel is helpful. Obviously, you have to pay for your coach's hotel or your trainer or whoever is with you. But, like, being able to have that expense kind of taken care of is obviously helpful. Yeah. So that's good. What's it like being on the council? What's the responsibility and conversations like there? Well, I'm I'm not on anymore. I was on yeah. for four years. Um, and it was good. I just... I talk too much and have too much, too many opinions to be on there, <laughs> maybe because I was just wear myself out. Um, but no, it's good. We we're able to change a lot, and I think in big organizations, it's hard to make changes quickly. Like everything takes a bit of time, and everything takes like it's a process. And I think obviously within the last like three or four years, we've had so many issues in terms of COVID and just tournaments and just it, just so many things that have been truly like just exhausting like I don't know we always say we don't know how our CEO does it because he like has taken everything with stride but it is it's hard it's hard to run a company in a business where you know tournaments also have a seat at the table and they're you know they have opinions on how they want things to be run the tour has opinions on how things they want things to be run and um just in general I would say COVID China, Saudi, uh, Ukraine, like all of these things have been like major factors in the tours over the last couple of years. And it's made it difficult. And yeah. I think trying to support all of those different players at every single turn has been hard. But I think that's the point of, you know, everyone playing on a global tour when there's so many different things happening. Um, it's been interesting. But I think the things that we want change, it does take a while. And I think that's why people have been frustrated. But um Things are changing. Okay. How do you feel about the PTPA? Oh. Oh, we can't talk about that. Do you want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think obviously Novak's trying to do a good thing. And I think it just takes more time to like understand what they're doing and mm -hmm. try how they're trying to help players. Um, I think a lot of the things that they have done have been in the like trying to help players in the best interest of the players, but it's just kind of how they fit in with the organizations, with the WTA and ATP, and how they find themselves, how players find them find them useful and how they can really, like, utilize them. Because at the end of the day, the WTA and ATP have been around for a really long time, and so another organization coming in and trying to basically do the same thing but just better mm -hmm. doesn't always work, okay. but it's always doesn't always work as quickly as people think. Are lots of the pros um, at the higher level supportive of them, or you don't know? Um, I don't know. I, I think they have a lot of people on board. I know they have like a their version of like a council. Um, they have a bunch of different things, but it's obviously always going to be tough when players are divided. So if half the players are with the ATP and WTA and the other half are with PTA, PTPA, it doesn't really help anyone either. Right. So it's like having everyone on the same page on the same team is what's going to, you know, make us get more money when they're doing 
TV rights deals or new betting deals or whatever it is. Like if everyone's aligned, we all win, right? Yeah. But if we divide it in three parts, like, eh. <laughs> eh, we'll see. Maybe you don't answer this. So okay. Don't. <laughs> don't want to. But the, I'm going to ask the question, but don't answer. <laughs> ask anyway. So okay. We saw the, there was like rumored like some a Saudi offer to like join the tours or something and put big money into the tours. Would you be for that? Against it? But which one? I feel like there's like a bunch yeah, of different. He said, <laughs> you said anything like, into the group chat? There was recently some, I, I, I didn't pay attention to it. Are you talking some, about like the Premier League thing yeah, that the they're Premier talking League about? Yeah, the Premier League thing, yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's like. Yeah, I like think kind of, some company made an investment, or they. I don't even know if it was WTA. Was it WTA? Or I think it was. There was both tours. Oh, okay. like, yeah, they were like talking about doing like a premier, like league and having yeah. like bringing the slums in. Yeah, I I've heard of it. I, I'm not too clear. I think that they are like in the beginning process. Of, yeah, like okay. I think they're trying to like figure out what they're doing. Um, I think the tournaments would still be like fully back, like. Australian Open is like backed by the government. Like mm-hmm. I think all of those tournaments would still be backed by whoever there, yeah. you know, gives them subsidies or whatever. Um, I don't know how involved Saudi would be, but obviously they're trying to bring a lot of tennis to Saudi, so I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's just something that it's kind of that's where it's going, right? Tennis mm-hmm. around the world and globally is has changed and been developing. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were one of the groups too, but I mean, you can't really, like, take it serious until it's, like, in front of you, right? Yeah, so true. I think, a lot, like, we already have slams. We already have, you know, like, Grand Slam agreements. We have all these things. So to, like, do that over again with the whole entire new tour and everything, I think it would be complicated. Yeah. But it could work. I mean, if, if it makes sense and it works for everyone and players make more money and we can, you know, make more money faster and all that, I think it's worth it. Um but it just honestly just depends. It's like way more complicated than just like, I want to make more money and like, money. let's go to a different, another tour type of thing. Yeah. So we talked about the game changing in that way, but from being on court, could, do you have any sense of if the WCA or the women's game has changed over the years? Uh, Yeah, I would say a lot has changed. I'd say like the speed of which people play is faster. I would say the balls are different every week. The courts are different every week. The speed of the courts are different every week. Um, how much grain are in the courts are different every week. The stringers are different every week, um, which just makes everything different. I think there was more consistency probably 10 years ago, like when I first came on the tour, all the balls being the same, like pretty similar stringers week in and week out. Like just as obviously as tournaments want to make more money and cut costs down. They just kind of take their own angles of things, which is totally fine. It's just that it gives a lot of, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It gives a lot of like discrepancy throughout the year of like which balls are where, what surface you're playing on, how slow one court is, how fast another court is. Like those are just things that are different and I think that affects how players play that affects players shoulders if there's more injuries if there's less injuries people's knees being bad the whole like thing it's like always affects like the broader group yeah. which I mean yeah so how would you have, change it oh so, my god you have a question let him ask no, <laughs> no I'll just guess, ask a lot of pros are saying they got hurt from the ball the frequent ball, ball gate changes. yes um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you had any injuries or any? I haven't had any aches, injuries aches or pains from the from, ball changes. No, I, I wouldn't say from the ball changes. I've had anything. I would say the court surfaces, but I mean the balls. Like the balls are very subtle. Like where you feel like elbow pain or you feel like your shoulders tighter or like things like that. I would say I've noticed that over the last like two years. It's kind of gotten a little bit weird. Um, but guys are different. You guys serve more with your balls, serve harder. Like it's a whole thing. Like now you can like clearly see the balls are like fluffing up. Like you can see clear differences like with your eyes. Whereas before you really couldn't tell people weren't really paying attention. And then now again, so many different things have changed. Dynamics have changed with the courts, with the balls, with the stringers, with the string, like stringers so like are so different now. Like I play with the string, Somebody else has a different string. Like, it's just like everything is a, is really different. And I think that, like, the people playing the ten- the actual tennis, ha- like, our bodies haven't caught up with it yet, mm-hmm. if that makes yeah. sense. Did you change anything, um, like, with rackets or string, anything 
you know, with the with the different changes? Did you do anything differently besides obviously just string out different tensions? But did you try messing around with any with strings? Well, I guess you didn't really have any. Like no. I had a foot injury, ball. which was from bad shoes, okay. but I would say I did change my racket probably. I changed my racket last year. Last year I played with a different racket all season and I was like, no, 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 I got to go back to my, <laughs> to my old faithful. So I went back to my old rackets, um, but that was pretty much it. I mean, it's harder, again, a lot harder to control the balls and all of these like different dynamics and like week to week. Um, so that's also tough and you have to be way more diligent on like, what you're stringing at, how tight you're stringing, how loose, how you're changing it, when you're going to altitude, when you're going to asphalt, when you're on concrete, like those, all of those things make a difference and you just have to be paying a lot more attention. And... Yeah. What surface do you prefer? Um, I love clay. Clay's my favorite surface. Um, but... Yuck. What? <laughs> Good surface though, right, clay? No yeah. Chance. It looks great. From me looking at the match, looks great. Slider raw. It's like when I have to get that. Yeah. That's the best. Jade, I could definitely beat you in a baseline game on like at French Open for sure. I'm not gonna sit here and say no. You think I want to sit here and argue with you? Put me on a hard court and I'll be okay. But clay courts, I don't know. What? Yeah, no. So it's like those things make a difference are for you, sure. Are you sensitive? Really sensitive to like racket weights and stuff? Because I know some players are like super picky. Uh, Your side yeah. players. You're some players. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm. I'm not. I could probably play with any racket, right? But when I'm like trained, like if we were like, oh, we're going to go play right now, I could play with any racket. Like I could like practice. Beat I could beat you in the base game. Yes. Um, with with his own racket. Yeah. So yeah, I would be fine to do that. But I would, I feel like there is a little bit of like trust with your racket when you're playing a match. Like I can definitely tell, like you can tell the difference if you're playing a match. But if you're just like hitting or whatever, I can't, I'm like, eh, it's okay. That's true. All right, we have a a ten year old girl watches the mm-hmm. podcast. Her name is Addy. Okay, Addy. I'm not sure how they pronounce her name. Addy, yeah. and I think she wants to be a right. tennis player. Oh. What do you think she should be focusing on right now at ten years old? For instance, I say the next, I don't know, two three years. What should her focus be on? Oh, she wants to be a WTA player. Oh, she wants to be WTA. Player. I would say have fun. Enjoy it. Obviously, it gets very serious when you're like 18 if you want to be a WTA player because you're like paying bills and you're an adult. Um, So enjoy it now while you can. Um, Learn as much as you can. Be a sponge. Listen to your coaches. um, And don't be afraid to give 100%. I like that. That's good. We have uh, another tradition we're doing now. We're going to give you three things. Okay. And you have to write them for me. I'm going to give you different kind of categories. I'm going to rank these things. Oh, I love this game. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I got three categories today. Okay. First one, we're flying. We're going to go, you're in the back seat of a plane, so you got no recline. Okay. Back seat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like right by the bathroom. Right by the bathroom. You're, you can't go back. <laughs> you're in the exit, but like you in got, the back row. You got aisle in the back seat. Okay. You got window mm-hmm. in the back seat, or you got an exit row, big room. You got Leg space, but you in the middle. No, window seat, 1,000%. No recline. No recline. What's two? <sighs> Aisle, and then window seat, or then exit yeah. row. So legs mean nothing to you? Leg nothing. Row. I literally don't ever move on the plane. I don't get up. You sleep? Yeah. I literally am that person who we sit down, I put my seatbelt on, and I'm like... I wake, I wake up when, when we love. Yeah, I'm, like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm like, no. I fall asleep before the plane takes off most of the no, time. I fall asleep absolutely. before the t- plane takes off, and I wake up before the plane takes off. <laughs> 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 I love that. Okay, okay no. But I do have a fun story. I flew, after winning the U.S. Open, I flew from New York to Los Angeles economy. But I fly everywhere economy. I never fly first class. You flew economy after the US over. Yeah, there was no flights. And I flew middle seat back home. Wait, how come you always fly economy? Just because I'm cheap and I don't move. So if I have a window seat, I literally go to sleep. I don't wake up. I never even go to like, the bathroom. But if they give you upgrades and stuff, you take it. Yeah, like I, I mean, I do fly life. first class and stuff if I book it like way in advance or like whatever. But like, it's the one thing that like my mom despises about me. My husband despises about me. I will not fly first class. So your mom's on a flight. She's up front or in the back. No, I like guilt everyone into flying economy. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm bad. laughs> Unless funny. it's like really far, like 
we flew to South Africa, obviously we're flying business, but like if we fly like here, I flew from LA to here economy, JetBlue. They have, but they're like, all of their seats are big, so it's fine. Okay. Economy. Yeah, true. But most of the time, only economy. Like, don't waste your money. Don't waste your money. Okay? <laughs> don't waste your money. Right. They give you a complimentary upgrade. No, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> Service okay. the back. I want to be by the bathroom. Economy. Okay. All right. LA, Miami, New York. Ooh. LA, Miami, New York. In that order? Yeah. LA, Miami, New York. Mm-hmm. LA? I haven't been to New York that much, though. I haven't been to Miami. You played though. it was open there, though. No? Oh, yeah. I uh, didn't enjoy it. No, clearly <laughs> not. Why you stayed in? It uh, was open. Uh, in in the city, I can't remember the hotel. Uh, I'll put New York. I didn't really do anything there, though. Mm. Oh, it wasn't like popping for you. No. I mean, no. I guess it could have been, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, this uh, wasn't. But it could have been. But uh, LA first for you all day, right? Yeah, LA first all day. I'll go to New York and then Miami. You? Miami's third? Miami is one for me. I can live. That's weak. Live. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to Miami first. I've been like two times. Whoa. I'm going to Miami. Wait, 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 wait. Why didn't y'all invite him to the party last night? Wow. <laughs> what what? Is That's it? crazy. <laughs> wait. Wow. Wait, do, you, no, no. do they make you listen to their music? Yeah. But it's not really his thing. You know what I mean? Oh, you're like, you stay at home? No, no, he well, goes, but it's just a deep, prefer a different vibe, I would say. Oh, um, do you drink alcohol? A little bit. On the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, we're getting two person. I'll ask him off the screen. Okay, hey, we asked the questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Miami first. Yeah. Miami one. LA. LA two, New York three. Yeah, yeah. I think I agree with you. All right, last one. Okay. This one for the road. Ooh. Jerk chicken, mm. oxtail, or curry with roti? Ooh, jerk yep. chicken number one, oxtail and curry. Whoa. Brody, I agree. I think I agree. Jerk no, maybe one? maybe oxtail yeah. was in three. I First of all, have you had jerk chicken from the jerk machine with extra brown stew gravy on it? Brad, no. stop. Jerk yeah. is three for me. What? Jerk chicken come last for me. What you think? With dark meat, <laughs> like come on, bro. What? I don't think I'm qualified to answer. <laughs> <laughs> what you got? What you order? Yeah, I think jerk jerk chicken goes one, and then maybe curry two, oxtail three. The oxtail had last night was slapping. I think I might have. It was good. I, have, I'm, I don't think I've ever had it from there. It was so good. I mean, the food takes forever. It was like 45 minutes for the oxtail, but it was worth it. And I had a little festival on the side. Nice. I told her, I was like, give me some extra gravy. Cause, you know, I think I think it's lost, bro. Did you have it in Jamaica? No, I was drinking in Jamaica. What are you talking about then? <laughs> So why can't you jerk chicken nowhere else? No, no. you never had like good jerk chicken, so you can't. Like, what you said? Jerk from where? The machine? Jerk machine. Where's that? Down the street. Want me to take you? Right. So there. it's not in Jamaica. No, but so I the jerk chicken that Joe reference was not in Jamaica. No. All right. Then. But the one that you have access to right here down the street, we're not going to Jamaica tomorrow. You can't base. <laughs> you can't the Miami base, Open. You like, can't base all the food off of. The little bit that you've had, you have to base it off. Like you have to compare the good ones to the good ones. You know what I mean? I tell you, based on what I've eaten in my life, I got jerk chicken at three, and I probably got curry at one, and then oxtail at two. What? Yeah. Oh wait, why didn't you put like conch salad or like anything? Because I had that too last night. And that I, was. I, I didn't oh, wait, that conch salad before. last night. I had it last night. It was so good. Conch salad, crack <laughs> conch, conch fritters. Conch salad, fritters, and then crack. What you saying, man? This guy's going fried first, for sure. Really? Oh, you want those? I was going the three, I think, for him. For one of those. <laughs> what? It's conch. As, as long as the, the comfort is, like, conky, a lot of conk in it. Because sometimes, especially if you four. Yeah, it, just like the bridges. It's, just, it's, just, yeah, it's yeah. just the bottle. But I probably, I might get to go crack conk first. For the viewers, this crack is Bahamian first. delicacy. For no, this. but the one I had last night was so spicy. It was Conf so salad. good. You like spicy food? Oh, I love spicy. But it was it was hitting. Your family is Caribbean, right? You yeah. have, what, is it your mom? My grandpa is from Trinidad. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then my great-grandpa is from Antigua. Wait, really? Your mm-hmm. great-granda is from Antigua? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Well, you don't know. Or See? probably cousins. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, before we roll, Sloan, is there anything... Um, any last words anything you want to say for the foundation or any 
Um, any new projects you got? Yeah, any projects. Wait, I thought your mom had a question. My mom had a question. Yeah. Oh, no, that was Justin's mom. Oh, that was your mom. Yeah, I worked it into the into the podcast though already. Oh, well, can we give a shout out to your mom? Because you, like, didn't let her be known. Sonia Roberts, eh? Okay, come on, Sonia Roberts. My sister What's is up? a fan of yours, Savannah. Oh, Savannah. My brother, hey, girl. Too, Alexis. Alexis. <laughs> and my father, Bruno. I don't know if he's a fan, but he's probably going to watch this. Though. Well, you better be a fan, Bruno, today. <laughs> we need them YouTube views. Come on, Bruno. <laughs> don't play around. Um, hey, no. Can you say hi to my mom? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. Her name is Julie. Okay, come on, Julie. Who else? Who else? You got What's some friends? Uh, no, nah, just my mom. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, now this is that's great. That's messed up, man. That was, that's crazy. You don't know no other people. Uh, some aunties that. or something. Um, they're all in China. Okay, that's fine. Wait, you're Chinese? <laughs> Sorry. Are you? What? <laughs> Tim is he's American. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's well. Chinese. That's sweet Chinese. Okay, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, thanks for having me on your pod. I hope this helps. Thank, Thank you. you for doing we it. So too. I <laughs> hope that you guys get some views and make more than ten dollars. I'm gonna have all of my friends watch it. So okay. hopefully it was good. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Yeah. No, I did. It was amazing. And remember to download. No, no. Whatever. Just go to the website. <laughs> go to the website. Put in the the code change over the checkout. Change over checkout. Get a hundred dollars off. Get a hundred dollars off. Like, subscribe, comment, wherever you watch. Share. Oh, comment, share, wherever you watch podcasts. We're now on YouTube. We're going to have all these little blurbs on Instagram. We're going to do a little collab post. So make sure you tune in. You don't want to miss out. Thank you. Just like that. <laughs>